Now she got to kiss George Clooney. <laughs> I uh, thank you for that. Uh, I want to uh, quickly uh, thank everyone here and uh, thank uh, Connected Health for inviting me. I've been coming to this uh, with some great regularity since it started. One of the companies I started was a company called Telcare, which uh, was in the, uh, uh, and still is in, the uh, uh, cellular-enabled uh, blood glucose business for management and assistance of folks with type 2 diabetes. So I'm coming today under false flag. I want to be sure that everybody understands. I am a president of a foundation, but I, until uh, March of this year, I didn't know how to spell 501c3. So it's always been a for-profit enterprise, uh, long-standing family history of uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, I personally am at great risk. Uh, my grandmother had it. Uh, she had her first eight children on the farm and her last four in a hospital for something new, different. Uh, of that Irish Catholic family, eight so far have succumbed to the disease, a little later than normal, uh, so about 72 to 75. If we acquire the disease, we become symptomatic. I am 60 years old. I am in the bell curve of the middle of my baby boomer generation uh, cousins, and my aunts and uncles and father were all very uh, prolific as they were told to be and were fruitful and multiplied. So I have 80 first cousins that are uh, subject to the same condition that I am. So I come and talk to you today from a patient advocate's point of view, not as an entrepreneur's point of view. Uh, three things I'd like you folks to take away from this presentation. Uh, the first is I want to describe an opportunity because I've been in the connected health business. I think there's a technological application for Alzheimer's that's being missed by the industry in large part. I then want to talk about uh, some of the challenges with that technological opportunity and as any good entrepreneur, a, uh, at least a partial solution. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, all trials have a problem uh, with recruiting, Alzheimer's more so. Uh, every, I was going through the terrific posters out here and they were all talking about how difficult it was to recruit. Imagine this, the field today is looking for people to test for therapies that the inclusion criteria are over 60, maybe 65 years of age. They have not had cancer in the last five years. They are not insulin dependent, and they don't have a pacemaker. Think of how broad and uh, nonspecific that inclusion criteria is. We are now looking for the healthy elderly, and that makes the recruiting process for Alzheimer's twice as long and three times more expensive. <clears throat> This slide speaks to what all of you know, but let me just summarize by saying uh, there has not been a successful drug approved in Alzheimer's since 2002. And Ms. Jenkins said that if you're 65 today, uh, you have a good shot of living to being over 100. The bad news is that you'll live, have better than a 50-50 chance that the second half of that span, the last 20 some years, you will have Alzheimer's if we don't get a therapy, probably a little higher. So the opportunity is for, connect, for technology to address itself to the fact that 33% of trial costs in Alzheimer's drugs uh, are in the recruitment stage and rising. Because this data comes from a field uh, at a time when the field was taking MCI, mild AD, and moderate AD patients in increasing quantities than they will in the future. The average per rec uh, recruitment cost for sponsors, as it says behind me, uh, is between 5,500 for a phase one and 7,000, seven, it's really $8,000 for a phase three average participant recruitment cost. Uh, screening and diagnostics are going up, and I'll explain why, because this is one of the big opportunities, but think in terms of closer to $45,000, $50,000 per trial participant, not thirty-nine. <clears throat> I just gave you this, this is the important data 
that we've only had one approved drug since 2002. There is some good news coming, I promise. Uh, we have uh, uh, more data, so I'm going to just run through this because I want to get to the, what I call the money slide because I want to show the, the audience the enormous market for wireless technology and this and other clinical trials. Here's the good news. In my, I've been uh, an advocate in this space with a number of colleagues since 2004. Uh, the pipeline has never been as rich as it is today. There's 57 drugs in phase two. There's 50, 29, uh, it says 23. I think it's actually 29 in uh, phase three. Uh, they are looking at more mechanisms of action, more targets that uh, heretofore were ever followed. And they're all looking for a recruitment pool that translates. This is where the recruitment numbers I'm going to show you next come from. This is just all the phase threes that are going to have in a potential approval date in five years. This is good news. If we don't recruit better, if we don't enroll better, if we don't engage and retain them in these trials better, every one of these trials is at risk to slip a year and a half to two years. Enormous, and, the, and then the, and then the uh, waterfall effect of that in terms of two, phase two's getting done and other trials getting done is a threat to us and society. One, one thing about society, and then I'll go to the uh, slide I really will spend most of my time on. <clears throat> Roy Blunt, I'm from Washington, D.C., so, you know, industry there is called politics. Roy Blunt, a senior senator from Missouri who's up for re-election and by no means a bleeding heart liberal, sits in uh, the Senate Health uh, Committee that appropriates money to the NIH. He has doubled the budget for the National Institute of Aging because he says, quote, if we don't do something about Alzheimer's by 2030, Alzheimer's will cost this country more than the national defense budget. That's how the conservative mindset is about this disease. So there's going to be money out there to solve this thing, but we all have to start thinking. So this is one of the problems of the industry, which is not uncommon, is pharma is appropriately uh, conservative about sharing their data. And there are very few NIA trials that uh, can share their data, although the A4 being run by Risa Sperling at Brigham uh, is uh, very good at collecting their recruiting data. We did our own study, not as good as you guys did here, because I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, not a scientist, but we did our own study with University of California, San Francisco's Brain Health Registry. We spent about a million dollars on a marketing campaign. We tried to get recruit patients digitally through this Facebook, Google Ads, the normal techniques, also uh, PSAs. Boston was one of the markets. And the results were underwhelming. There are a lot of reasons for it. But if you back into what's at the bottom here, which is, I just showed you, phase three drugs. I'll back up. Phase three drugs represent a number of randomizations are required over the next five years. So then we asked ourselves, well, if I have to randomize 4,500 people, and we saw our results in our marketing campaign on a pure digital marketing campaign, how many people do I have to start on the top of the curve to to get to a 4,500 randomization in 2016? That's a big number, 7 million people, plus or minus. Our cost of acquisition, which I don't have on that slide, was just under $100. So that's $700 million to do a digital campaign to randomize 4,500 participants? That's crazy. Nobody's going to do that. And there's plenty of reason to believe that we can change this dynamic. So let me tell you what the business opportunity is. <clears throat> there are some great nascent examples of uh, wireless technology and digital apps that could apply themselves to the referred to screened levels of this chart bypass the broad uh, digital campaigns to the wild and try and reach people and create both connection, enthusiasm, and knowledge about a potential trial for folks over 60 years old. Now, 
the thing I want to em emphasize here is when I had uh, my companies, I spent a lot of time, and it was mostly a good time, with over 30 venture capitalists in my career. And they're mostly thoughtful guys, pretty smart, and they're always looking, especially in this industry, okay, show me the ROI, have, how many of you heard that? And show me what the size of the market is and how fast it's gonna grow. So I'm gonna do that for you today. On the referral side, if we really need to hit 675,000 people, uh, they're gonna spend this year about $1.2 billion across all the trials to get referrals down to uh, 30,000 available for screening. That's gonna come across in a multitude of different ways. Then in the screening process, we're gonna spend roughly, according to our numbers, about $2.5 billion to screen these folks cognitively, clinically, family history, phenotyping. There's no app. There's no way to take the beta amyloid scan necessary to get a dispositive uh, inclusion in a trial. But there's a lot of stuff we can do remotely to uh, do a lot of those other functions. So in referrals, the referral market uh, is pricing out around $2,000 to $2,500 a referral. Now, when over in the diabetes world, in the connective health realm, uh, you're not going to see more than about $250 a year for a, a person in a connect, your portion of the revenue of connecting somebody in diabetes and giving them information and keeping them uh, compliant with their uh, wellness or their insulin or their metformin. And it can range between $250 and $500, but $250 is the norm. If you have an opportunity to participate in a $2,500 payment one time uh, and have that occur within a period of two months, that's an interesting revenue model. How much of that would a connected health solution get will obviously be a function of how much uh, functionality you bring to the product line. But to just truncate time and to, tr and to add a better view into who might not have a screen fail rate, and this screen fail rate is running between 75 and 90%, depending on what the protocol is. Now let me talk about screening. Screens are running somewhere between uh, $20,000 and $10,000 per screen cost and then when you have the screen fail rate, the average enrolled participant, before you even get them through the trial, is costing industry and the NIA about $50,000 when you only can enroll one out of five. So if you can bring remote technology to the marketplace to get a solid screen on cognition, better yet, a solid screen on cognition that's predictive of beta amyloid loads, because that's currently the gold standard, uh, you have now got a big argument for a big piece of that $20,000 because you're going to drop the screen fail rate, you're going to advance the screening out into the wild rather than on the site because sites can't take more people right now. These screen fail rates are choking the trial site's ability to actually process them. So our GAP foundation model is, okay, we're going to get technology in the red band and the green band. We're going to get it paid for and we're gonna shorten trial time. And there are some interesting technologies, but I come to you today, to this conference, telling you it's virtually untapped. And I've been in this business, as you can tell, with gray hair and too much weight, a long time. This is an interesting market. So how many of there, these folks are there gonna be? Well, our analysis shows to do this at these numbers, uh, you're gonna go from 4,500 participants randomized and require roughly 30,000 screens to 50,000 in two years. It's gonna go up 10X and you're gonna need 300,000 screens because all those trials I just showed you are brand new and there are more coming. We do need a couple successes though or the capital will dry up again, but um, it's plenty big enough. We're talking about today an addressable market of $3 billion. That doesn't mean the, our, the uh, connected health technologies will get all of that three billion, but from where I've sat when I've been in the business, 
we, we have an argument to make to get a big chunk of that, much more than you do when you're doing wellness. And I have no problem with wellness. I sit on the board of a great wellness company. I still believe in it. But if I had these, if I w I'm sort of sitting there like the guy, uh, I'm now in the not-for-profit business, and I look at this and say, I should be starting another company. So let me talk to you about, so that's the opportunity. What's the problem? Any of you that have done this or come from an academic environment, number one problem is you need to be validated. You need to be uh, evidence-based. Because if you're not, the marketplace of pharma, the FDA, and the NIA is going to say be quite dubious about the quality of the data that you provide. So how are you going to get that? We'll come to that in a second. Let me just say one or two words about us. <clears throat> Uh, our funding uh, aspires to reach $100 million. I've raised a lot of money, so that's a big number, but not beyond our reach. We have about $25 million of it raised already. Uh, we have just announced uh, the creation of our global Alzheimer's platform network. It's 37 uh, of the best, or some of the best. They certainly aren't all of them. Uh, 37 of the uh, Alzheimer's disease clinical trial sites in the United States and a couple in Canada. I only have three minutes left, so I've got to hurry. The important point is that we are trying to create within that network an environment. Oh, by the way, big difference about us versus most of these networks that you might be familiar with. We are nearly one half commercial sites. So we are trying to get the Hatfields to play with the McCoys. We're going to ask academic sites to infuse a level of discipline and their adherence to rigor uh, from a scientific point of view to the extent our commercial sites can benefit from that over in the commercial sites. But the commercial sites are demonstrably better at recruiting faster. And uh, then the open argument is who's better at giving a participant experience and uh, who's better at retaining patients and participants, and we're happy to have that discussion because we're going to play for best practices. Our goal is to shorten the time of trials by two years. You can read the rest of that. Uh, we've done some other things just quickly. Standard IRB, single IRB, so we picked Shulman. Uh, we have common contract language. We've done a lot of stuff. It's just boring blocking and tackling, maybe. But if you're in the business of clinical trials, this is a big deal. And as a consequence, we can change the speed at which things get done. So if you have a problem with validation, access to clinical trials to make technology, prove technology will work against an evidence-based standard, what you really need is some place where you can ask people to look at your technology and begin to give you a trial across a couple sites that demonstrates and gives you that evidence-based underpinning. That's the hidden third uh, objective of my speech. We're in the business of helping you validate your technologies. You guys come to us. We're not going to take you all. But we plan to be very wide open to trying to use some of the best researchers in the business to bring your technologies forward put them in trials, put them in pre-trial. We have something called the pre-processor, which is basically trying to get in front of pharmas or NIA protocols with technologies that will be more predictive and enhancing of the likelihood of getting folks into trials uh, uh, with a lower screen fail rate. I know it doesn't sound sexy. It's hugely beneficial to the field, and it's worth a lot of money. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. I intentionally did not want to skew this discussion towards uh, what so many of my smarter colleagues have done and say, look at this great wearable or look at this great app. Because uh, uh, we are wide open to anything, but we've got to be, and I do not come from this kind of rigor. But I'm telling you, what the marketplace wants is a trial that peer reviews it to say it actually got the result that you purport to uh, have it get. If we can do that, we can help you market the technology. I have nine pharma funders. I have six large foundations, and we're just growing. So we have a ready-made user of technology that we incubate or accelerate once we put them through our clinic, clinic clinics. So the ones I just want to quickly 
I'm all out of time. So the ones I will quickly identify are uh, just being able to get security around that the participant's actually the one giving remote, uh, the remote information this is a big deal with the FDA. Another is being predictive of who's going to be beta, beta amyloid positive. I think I'll actually end on that one because it's so intriguing. If you can figure out a wireless way to anticipate cognitive impairment that's reasonably correlated with beta amyloid positivity, that's worth $8,000 a participant. There's nothing I saw when I was in this business that had that throw weight. So it's a worthy target because we're going to look for 500,000 of those participants in the next 10 years, minimum. So, this slide says we're going to debunk the myths. We are going to debunk the myths, but we're going to help you get trials done as reasonably quickly as we can. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention.